So welcome again. Uh, my name's Aaron, and uh, we have Dave here. We're both from Vintage Fitness. I recognize a lot of your your faces and your names. Um, we do, we have a, a company that specializes with seniors. We do personal training with seniors, both virtually, so we're using Zoom, and in person across the greater Toronto area. There's a team of 15 uh, personal trainers, and um, we work in about, um, I think it's nine languages now. So very specialized. We've been doing this work for about 17 years. And uh, if you're not a regular attendees of our webinars, we do a webinar about seniors health and fitness every six weeks, usually on a Wednesday. So I'd like to introduce Dave, who is one of the personal trainers for Vintage Fitness and a real wealth of information. He has done a lot of work in training specifically around uh, low back and posture, spine sparing movements. Um, so I'm really impressed with his knowledge and I really appreciate him taking the time to pull that together in a webinar for us. So again, thanks so much, Dave, and I'll uh, let you take it over now. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron, and welcome everybody. So today we're looking at managing low back pain. And I just wanted to introduce myself uh, very quickly as well, a little bit about who I am. When I retired from Environment Canada after about 34 years, I was looking for something to do. You know, what am I going to do when I finally grow up? And I ended up becoming a personal trainer in, in 2013. <clears throat> and this gave me a couple of opportunities. One, I, I really in, I'm intrigued by how the body works. So this gave me an opportunity to look into that. Uh, my parents had just uh, gone into their 80s and they wanted to remain living independently so this gave me a mechanism to help them and I was also a karate instructor back then and so this would give me some insights into understanding what my body was doing as, as I was learning some of those katas and, and karate moves. So I've uh, since becoming a trainer I've run various fitness classes for those over 55 in addition to many uh, workshops, including stuff on the low back, stretching and foam rolling. I've worked successfully with many clients referred to me by a chiropractor, and most of those people have had low back issues. My specialties as a trainer include low back, core conditioning, posture, functional movement, stretching, and working with a foam roller, which is, oh, you want to relax in the evening? That's the way to do it. All right, and there we go. So as we all know, a healthy low back is an integral part of keeping active as we age. And in addition to that, there's studies all around the world that have told us that movement and exercise are preventative actions for more than 25 chronic conditions associated with aging. And there are lots of examples, heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, several cancers, that sort of thing. So movement and exercise can be preventative for some of these conditions. And in addition, we know that physical activity can help manage other diseases, such as type two diabetes, high blood pressure, depression. So the question is, how do we take advantage of all of these benefits of exercise and keep doing the things we do when we have low back pain? Well, today we're going to answer the, the question, uh, in five segments. First one, we're going to look at what causes back pain. The second part, we're going to look at understanding your back. And the last three are going to be more solutions oriented. And so we'll be looking at how do you avoid daily activities that could be pain triggers, some spine friendly movements for everyday life. And in the next steps, we'll be looking at how to build a foundation for pain free living. So let's move on. Well, what causes back pain? We're going to look at the types of back pain, common causes, our biological capacity. And what about age? A lot of people say, well, as we get older, it's natural to have low back pain. Well, no, it isn't. Um, and the impacts of, of low back pain. So there's two types we're, we're going to look at. One is acute pain, and that's from a, a recent injury, 
uh, this is where you you know you've done it. You, you went to move the fridge and your back said, ah, that's acute. So that's an acute injury. Chronic pain is simply longer term pain. And it could be from an old injury or it could be something that is built up over time. But the main thing here is that it's something that you can't, you don't have that aha moment. You can't trace it back to necessarily a single event. And usually when pain has been around for about 12 weeks, it's considered chronic. And this is the type of pain that we'll be focusing on for the rest of the webinar. So moving on to common causes of uh, chronic back pain, there are four main categories here. And this comes to us from the National Institutes of Health, uh, part of the US government. So it shows us mechanical problems, structural problems, inflammatory arthritis, and other medical conditions, which some of that stuff's pretty nefarious. Um, so for mechanical problems, this has typically been an injury to the muscle, the tendons, the ligaments that hasn't properly healed. And in fact, upwards of 20% of acute injuries uh, can end up becoming chronic. Other indications of mechanical problems are disc bulges, disc herniations, disc degeneration, spondylolithesis, which is uh, a slipped disc, uh, or injury to the, the bones of the spine. Structural problems, spinal stenosis. So this is- Dave, I'll just an, um, interject here for a second because it might be interesting for people to know the prevalence of disc de degeneration among seniors when, we, when they get x-rayed, which as far as my knowledge is about 80% of people is at over 65 have some disc degeneration. So all of our clients <laughs> have yeah, some, what do you say? Excellent point, Erin. Uh, uh, and actually <laughs> you're-, you're uh, I'm going to be getting that to that in a minute. But the, the main thing for this slide is there's those four main categories, but mechanical problems accounts for like 85 to 90% of those. By the time you get down to the other medical conditions, we're into a very, very small number. Okay, so let's uh, move on. And let's say that your doctor says you have a disc bulge at L4, L5, which is fairly common, or disc degeneration from L3 to L5. Is this really the cause of your pain? And the answer is maybe and maybe not. And the reason I say that is just what, what Aaron was saying. About 69% of people between the ages of 60 and 70 have a disc bulge and they are totally asymptomatic. And then about 88% of the people between the ages of 60 and 70 have disc degeneration and they are asymptomatic, no symptoms at all. So in answer to the question, I have a disc bulge, is that the cause of my pain? Well, maybe, maybe not. My question back to you is what caused the disc bulge in the first place? And perhaps we can look at those those things that cause the disc bulge in the first place as the sorts of things that are triggering your pain on a day-to-day -day basis. The main thing here is it's mechanical issues that have caused these injuries over time. So when you look at the blister, you look at the tire, you see these are mechanical problems. They have been caused by, in this case, poor movement repeated repeated, repeated, and repeated again. Some injuries appear quickly and others appear more slowly. And this is the repetitive strain injury, that sort of thing. The point is here, until the underlying mechanical problem is fixed, the damage will continue to accumulate. So the damage has appeared over time and the same with your back. The injury has built up over time. And for mechanical problems and some structural problems, it's really repetitive movement or motions. It's prolonged repetitive postures, how you sit, how you stand, and loads re repetitively lifted incorrectly. And every one of these things can trigger your pain every day. The neat thing is though, once we know what the pain triggers are, 
we can learn to avoid them. And this allows the part of the back that has become extremely sensitive to desensitize. We can learn new spine friendly movement patterns and we'll go over some of those today. We can build a foundation for pain-free movement and we'll give an introduction to that today. And all of that means we can increase your body's biological capacity to lift and move. Okay, there's a new term, biological capacity. Let's have a look at what that means. All of our muscles, ligaments, tendons, and bones have a biological capacity to lift and move. When we exceed that capacity, there's an injury. And it might not be something that you even notice at first, but just like the, the blister, you know, if you say, oh, there's something rubbing there and you look, there's nothing there. So there's nothing that shows. But if you now walk for another 10 or 15 minutes and the rubbing continues, eventually you'll see that injury. And the same thing with, with the back. So just because you exceed it once and don't see an injury or feel an injury doesn't mean that there isn't an injury. And over time, the injury will show itself as muscle fatigue. Then you'll feel a little discomfort, some inflammation, and then pain. Dave, just a quick question. Does biological capacity change as we age? Yes, when we're, uh, when we, if we don't move, if we don't exercise, sedentary living allows the, the core muscles that provide the, the capacity to slowly deteriorate with time. But the good news is, is we can rebuild that biological capacity. So when we look at, I, I just mentioned the core muscles, the main job of those core muscles is actually to protect the spine. And when their capacity has been exceeded, then there's an injury. And as I mentioned before, mechanical problems account for 85 to 90% of chronic back pain cases. So the question is, how can you exceed your biological capacity? Well, we've mentioned poor movement patterns, that's motions. We've mentioned poor posture repeated over and over again. And also lifting something too heavy, lifting incorrectly, that's load. So motions, posture, and loads, those are the three biggies. And those three biggies can lead to muscle or ligament strain or a tear. And like the blister, it just gets worse and worse with time. And eventually you get a feeling of discomfort and fatigue and pain. It can cause abnormal wear and tear, and it can lead to the disc bulge, disc herniation, those sorts of things. It can lead to osteoarthritis. Uh, that's what the unusual wear and tear does. Uh, spinal stenosis. Spinal stenosis can also be caused by uh, the natural aging process as well. But abnormal wear and tear on your back that is preventable can also lead to spinal stenosis, which is a narrowing of the spinal canal where, the, uh, where the, the, all of the, the nerves go down. It can lead to a, a spondylolithesis, which is a slip disc, or it can actually change the musculature in the spine and give you excessive lordosis or uh, kyphosis. There's also, as Aaron mentioned, an increased risk of exceeding your biological capacity with an inactive or sedentary lifestyle as the, the muscles slowly atrophy, the weak muscles get weaker, and that affects the integrity of, of the joints. And man, we got a whole pile of joints in our back. If you're overweight, well, that uh, can stress the joints a little bit more. There are job-related risks, or perhaps not as, as many with this group today, because I imagine most of us are retired. I know I am. Um, we can, uh, if we end up with weak or tight muscles, there are some genetic conditions that'll predispose you to uh, quickly exceeding your biological capacity. The main thing here is all of the above increase your chances of abnormal wear and tear on your joints and your body will respond with fatigue discomfort, and eventually pain. So as you might have guessed, our joints are actually mechanical systems. <coughs> Excuse me. 
excuse me. And just like our cars, they do wear with age. Now, if as we age, we maintain a sedentary lifestyle then the muscles will weaken, the joints will weaken and show unusual wear. So just like the tires on your car will show unusual wear and tear when they are underinflated or overinflated or the tires aren't balanced correctly there or there's an issue with your suspension, the same thing will happen with our bodies and the, uh, there's that unusual wear and tear. So there's two solutions here. One is preventative maintenance. So you get the tires balanced, you check the, the uh, in, inflation uh, and if you forget to do that, well, you end up replacing the tire, which creates new capacity for your, for your tire. But we can also rebuild our biological capacity. So if we haven't been doing preventative maintenance with our bodies, we can, main, we can rebuild that biological capacity. Now, what about age? Does it lead to back pain? Perhaps. Back pain does become more common with advancing age, but remember 85 to 90% of back pain cases are due to mechanical issues, motions, postures, and loads. Time then amplifies the effects of those mechanical issues. So you're repeating, 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 just like the blister, just like the tire, and then you, if you throw in some of those risk factors, such as sedentary living, where the muscles can atrophy and the, the joints then start to weaken and you get more unusual wear and tear, then that's setting up to eventually lead to back pain. And unfortunately, it isn't just the back that gets affected. Pain affects us physically and psychologically. So for example, back pain can inhibit some muscles from working correctly, for example, the, the glutes and the abdominals. And this causes changes in how we walk or how we do activities of daily living. And that can also exacerbate and create an unusual wear pattern. Pain also affects our mood and it can lead to depression. It affects our sleep quality and our sleep quantity. And our sleep quality, believe it or not, affects how we perceive pain. And they've done lots and lots of studies on this. And they've shown very conclusively that when they have created a situation in the laboratory where they brought in people that have had back pain or other pain, and they introduce something that prevents them from getting a good quality sleep, that their perception of pain changes and their perception of pain changes for the worst. So we want you to also have good sleep. And it can create a cycle of pain, which makes us reluctant to do certain activities because the brain is saying, remember the last time you did this, what happened? And so we become reluctant to do certain activities and we tend to withdraw and then become more sedentary and we create a feedback cycle. So the weaker muscles get weaker, the tight muscles get tighter, and overall that ends up with weak joints, unusual wear and tear. There's also an increased risk of, of a fall as the, the integrity of the joints becomes affected, and that can lead to more pain. So how do we break this cycle? reduce the pain and improve our quality of life. Let's start by understanding a bit about our back. We're gonna be looking at three sections very quickly, strength and flexibility of your back, the bones and the muscles, and the real key here, and will be the, the key to improving biological capacity is the three-dimensional guy wire system. So for strength and, and flexibility, our, our spines are absolutely marvelous structures. They can bear heavy loads while allowing movement. Think about the steel beam in your house. It's great at supporting your house, but you can't bend or twist it. 
You couldn't dance. You couldn't go for a walk if our spine was like the steel beam, which is fantastic for strength. And if you look at the other side, flexibility, well, a rope is, is very, very flexible. You can bend it and twist it all you want, and it's strong when you pull on it, but very weak when you push on it. But our spine can do all of that. It can be compressed, twisted, bent, and still support your body's weight and the load you carry in your arms, the load when you pick up your, your grandkids, or when you pick up a pot from the stove, or carry a backpack when you go on a hike. It can do all of those things. Yet it is also flexible. It bends, believe it or not, it has to bend so that we can breathe. And we're breathing like 20,000 times a day. Or when we do flowing movements like walking or dancing. So the question is, how can it be both strong and flexible? How can we do all of these things? Well, it's really all about our three-dimensional guy wire system. And it provides stability, it provides stiffness, it provides flexibility, and it balances all of these things depending on what it is that we need. So when you go to catch a ball or lift a pot from the stove, the core muscles actually fire first, and they provide the necessary stiffness and stability for you to be able to do these activities with the bigger muscles and your limbs. But an injury or sedentary lifestyle can weaken these muscles. So not only are they not protecting the spine properly, they may not even fire correctly, which means essentially the spine is, is naked. It doesn't have the protection of this three-dimensional guy wire system. So a delayed or a weak response by your core muscles means poor protection for the spine. Without stability, pain follows. Let me repeat, without stability, pain follows. So let's have a quick look at this three-dimensional guy wire system. Dave, just before you uh, go on, one thing I'd love to reiterate just to, and I'm sure you get into it in a little bit is core stability does not mean crunches. If you have low back pain, you should not be doing abdominal crunches. And we'll get that, get into that later. And Vipin, I know you asked a question, you know, what movements should I be doing with low back pain? Dave's going to get into that in a few minutes, but um, there's a, lots of ways to work your core that doesn't involve that kind of crunching movement, which is, can be quite damaging to the spine. Yeah, exactly. People forget that the core muscles are endurance muscles, so they have to be trained differently than our other big muscles that, that move our limbs. And yeah, we will be getting into that. It, but I have to admit, it just drives me nuts when I see people, you know, with a 20 pound weight doing, uh, doing 10 crunches and thinking that they're doing something fantastic for their body. In fact, most for most people that is not something you want to do okay so here's our spine and there's three sections to the spine and every section is comprised of bones called vertebrae that are stacked on each other each pair of vertebrae has the the little blue thing in between and that's the disc so each pair of vertebrae and, uh, and a disc is considered a joint. And our back has 24 moving joints between the cervical spine, which has seven, the thoracic spine or mid back, which has 12, and the lumbar spine, which has five. And here, just getting back to the crunches, let me show you why that's not a great idea. You notice that the vertebrae start off nice and small, and they get bigger and bigger as you go down the back. The main reason is these are meant for load. These are meant to absorb compressive forces. So when we get into uh, flexion movements that are very big flexion movements and with huge loads, then we actually could be com compromising and you may end up with a, a disc bulge uh, in the lumbar spine. And this is a good spot right there. And that's a good spot right there. 
Anyway, when Dave joined, says flexion, flexion movements, it's just essentially forward, going forward. So yeah, exactly. So that, that's the movement that we do when we, when we do the crunch. So these joints offer stability. They allow us to bend and twist. However, when we overload them or bend too far, then we can damage the discs. Okay, let's move on and, and look at the muscles. So we have tons of muscles to stabilize the, the spine as well as to allow movement. And it's very similar to what you see has happened to this, this palette here. We've got a whole pile of boxes on this palette. And when you load it into the truck, you don't want the boxes to be flying all over the place. So look at how they have strapped down or stabilized the boxes. They have, they have stuff running up and down. They have wrap going all the way around. And they have wrap that comes down on the diagonals. And this is really the core musculature that we have in our own bodies. And this allows movement of part of the spine or the entire spine and in many, many different directions. And as I said, we have 24 moving joints. So these muscles are your core muscles and really the key to the three-dimensional guy wire system. And when these core muscles work properly, then you can use the larger muscles, the limbs, to pick up a grandchild, lift groceries from your trunk, or throw a ball. And we'll just have a quick look at some of them. So uh, we've got layers and layers of muscles. And this is probably mid layer through the back. These are the erector spinae muscles. And you can see there's, there's quite a few. Some go all the way up the back. Some go partially up the back. So this allows uh, uh, movement for part of the spine or all of the spine. We also have these guys uh, here. That's quadratus lumborum. And they allow us to, to do some twisting movements and also some backward bending movements. So these are mainly the up and down type of muscles. Uh, there's one that I haven't shown. I didn't want to clutter too much. And that's the transverse abdominis. And that's the one that goes around and around. And it's really the deepest of all of our, our core muscles. And it's like having a seat belt for your spine. So here's some more up and down ones. This is your six pack, which is really an eight pack. And here's some of the diagonal ones. These are your external obliques. And underneath them are your internal obliques. And you notice they're also on the diagonal, but they go in the opposite direction to the external obliques. So this allows twisting movement or preventing twisting movement. So when you think about it, it's really no different than these guy wires on this cell tower. So what happens if when the guy wires start to weaken? What happens to the tower? Well, the tower is going to start moving, micro movements. The same thing happens with your, your spine. You start getting little micro movements. And like the micro movements, think about, uh, when your car tires are, are unbalanced, you hit a certain speed and you get a bit of a shudder. Well, the same thing is going to happen to your spine when these three-dimensional guy wires start to weaken. So they're not providing the support that you need for your spine. What happens if the guy wires on, on one side are, are stronger than the other? And I'm thinking about these people who will do crunches and crunches and crunches. So now they're working the six pack muscle, but are they also working the opposing muscles that run up and down the back? If you're not, then you're creating the situation just like with the guy wires here. Well, the guy wires on one side are gonna be very strong and on the other side, they're gonna be very weak. And guess what? It's eventually gonna pull the tower, the tower forward and exactly the same thing sets up for your spine. You will see this with uh, changes in, in your posture. So the muscle imbalance leads to poor functioning of the joints of the spine, and that leads to unusual wear and tear, 
discomfort and eventually pain. So what if all the guy wires start to weaken? Again, the same thing. So this is the sort of thing, sedentary living, uh, for example, the joints don't function properly, leading to poor stabilization, poor movement patterns, micro movements, unusual wear and tear. Without enough endurance and strength, then you quickly exceed the capacity and back pain follows. So now let's look at quickly capacity and your guy wire system. In someone with a healthy guy wire system, well, you've got flexibility and stiffness for moving the arms and legs to walk or catch a ball. You have stability to lift a pot or a grandchild. You get protection from micro movements and armor to protect the organs. Imagine those sets of muscles do a lot of things for us. Now, if you don't have a healthy guy wire system, then certain activities, daily living, can use up your capacity. Once the capacity is used up, then you get a sense of fatigue. You may even get a sense of, oh, oh no, I'm going to get that pain again, discomfort and then pain. So having capacity is like having money in your checking account. Every time you do a movement that would create a little, like for the blister, a little rubbing or a little micro movement, it's like writing a check on that checking account. When your bank balance approaches zero, there's the feeling of discomfort and the same thing with your back. As the biological capacity approaches zero, then you start feeling fatigue, discomfort, and eventually pain. So what can we do about it? Well, we would start by looking at activities of daily living that could be pain triggers. Now, these are, are individual. Everybody is, is, is individual, so everybody will have uh, very specific pain triggers. And we would need to do an assessment to find out what your pain triggers are. But let's show you some of the very common ones. Crunches. Sit-ups, I hate sit-ups. Leg raises, because again, when people raise their legs, if they don't have the flexibility in their hamstrings and glutes, then they end up putting the lumbar spine, which is the low back, into flexion. And flexion, a lot of people that I've run into are flexion intolerant. So all of these movements create flexion and if you're flexion intolerant, well, it's, it's just like being lactose intolerant. If you're lactose intolerant, what happens when you have dairy? Well, there's discomfort and there might be some pain. The same thing happens if your body, if your spine is flexion intolerant, you can also be compression intolerant, you can be uh, extension intolerant. These are the sorts of things that we would look at when we do the assessment. But these are very, very common ones. Um, knees to chest stretch. Again, if you don't have the flexibility, you rob it from the low back and that puts the low back into flexion. So you can do the knee to chest stretch, but just stop before your low back goes crunching into the floor. Uh, people reaching with their low back, um, pick up something from the floor, open the door, which means you're in fact lifting with your back. And one that people don't often think about, heavy lifting or full bending of the spine within one hour of waking up. And what's the reason for this? Well, as we know, the discs become nourished overnight. When we sleep, the body does a lot of maintenance and uh, nourishes the body. And the discs are actually a little bit thicker when you wake up. And in fact, when you stand up for the first time, in the morning, you're actually probably a quarter inch taller. And for me, that's a big deal. Uh, but gravity eventually just uh, uh, shrinks those back down to normal uh, size for when you're upright and gravity is, is, is acting on the body. But until that happens, and it can take 45 minutes to an hour, until that happens, when you do things like 
doing a toe touch when you first get out of bed, the compressive forces on your spine are about 300 times more than if you waited an hour and did the toe touch later. So it's very, very important not to do full bending of the spine or heavy lifting within one hour of waking up. But it just doesn't want to do it. And if you want to remember that, it's just like having a great big meal. You're not going to go and lift a bunch of boxes or help somebody move within an hour of finishing uh, a full meal. So these are some of the common pain triggers. And as I mentioned, we need to do an assessment to discover your specific pain triggers. So in someone who is flexion intolerant, these are the movements that would deplete their biological capacity. And every time they exceed, or every time they do those movements. So think about when we are brushing our teeth. Do we flex our spine to spit? Yes, we do. And then when we rinse and we spit again, yeah, we're doing it again. Um, when we tie our shoes improperly, all of those times, it's like every time that happens, you're writing a check. You're depleting your bank account. You're depleting your biological capacity. All right, so let me Dave, move on. Oh, bracing, yes. yeah. I was going to say that I think, I mean, all of us want to spit after we brush our teeth, but I think doing a, a core brace before you doing that movement really does help. Yes, and what I show my, my clients who are flexion and taller, I'll show them to do it as a hip hinge. But yes, we also want to brace first. Bracing is perhaps the most important thing. So we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at uh, hinging, uh, the hip hinge and how powerful that is for spine sparing movements. And we're going to be looking at, uh, at, at standing. So let me just uh, switch cameras here and I'll go over and we can, I'll show you some of those, uh, those things. All right. So, all right, I'm back again. <laughs> all right, so for bracing, I'm going to show you three ways to, to do a brace. And this is something that's important because if someone has had an injury, then the bracing mechanism may not necessarily be working properly. And so we need to build awareness and eventually the body figures it out and it starts doing uh, the, the bracing the way it should. So the first way of creating a brace, just put your, your fingers gently below your ribs and above your, your pelvis and feel what's, what's there. And actually you're, you're on the external obliques at this point and underneath that are the internal obliques. And underneath that is your transverse abdominus. So all that musculature is, is underneath. Now, if you say ha, ha, or just try and push your fingers out, you're in fact creating a brace. And you don't have to have a big brace to do a lot of the activities of daily living, typically even you know, five to 7% of the maximum contraction that, that you can do is really all that's needed. So part of what we do with clients is help them understand how much bracing is, is actually needed. So this is the first type of a brace. And notice when you push, I want you to push out, or if you say ha, ha, you'll feel your brace coming on. If, if that didn't work for you, then think about someone punching you in the, in the stomach, and you'll find that the same brace has, in fact, uh, come on. And there's a third way, too. Just think about if we do... Uh, I'm going to count to three, and after I say three, then just give yourself a gentle poke. So if I say one, two, three, poke, notice your brace has already come on. It was anticipating. Now, normally it's a lot faster than that. We're, we're talking a couple hundred microseconds um, that it would normally happen, but we've slowed it down just so that you can see the feeling of your own brace and you can make sure that the brace is on. 
So now I wanted to do a, a bend over uh, test just to see our mechanism of bending over. So take your middle finger and your thumb and put it above and below your belly button and then reach down as though you're picking up something that's on a chair. So about this level. And I want you to be aware when you do that, what happens to your fingers? Do your fingers come closer together? Do they go further apart? Or do they stay the same distance from each other? If they went together, then your strategy is to flex at your waist, to flex at your waist. If you used your hips to hinge forward, there's the, the hip bone. And if I use the hips to hinge forward, you notice these fingers stay the same distance apart. So I'm now using a different strategy. This is a spine sparing strategy. So for the hip hinge, again, we're moving from the hips. You notice the hips, the butt goes back, the knees stay where they are, and I can now pick up a grandchild and I'm not doing anything with my back. So let me show a different way. There's my spine now on the outside of my body. <laughs> And you'll notice with this dowel here, a broomstick works just as well. There's room for my fingers at the low back. This is the, the lumbar spine, and that's the normal curvature. Now, if I lose that curvature, then I, my strategy is to flex from the waist, which means I'm now changing the normal curvature of the lumbar spine. If instead I move from the hips, do you notice there's still room for my fingers here? And the dowel is still touching me, the head, the shoulders, and the butt as I go into that hip hinge movement. So this is a very important movement for us to consider if we are flexion intolerant. And that is for the case for a lot of people that, that I've trained with low back pain. So anyways, uh, let's move on to standing. And I think my whole body is in the picture here. If I'm standing correctly, then coming up from, from the floor, my ankle, the hip, the shoulder, and the ear should be in line. Now, a lot of us stand sort of slouched a little, and you notice I've now lost proper posture. What happens with proper posture or improper posture now? Feel the, uh, the, the muscles. So put your fingers now either side of your spine, about the same level as your belly button. So these are your spinal erectors. And if I'm leaning forward or my shoulders are forward or my head has come forward, you'll feel that these feel pretty tight. But if you come up into normal posture, now they're loose. They're very, very loose and relaxed. And in fact, the muscles on the front of my body and the muscles on my back of the body are now in sync. They're both firing at about the same rate and everything is nicely balanced. If however, my shoulders come forward, oop, there they go. Those muscles have now started to fire. So the question is, how do we stand and not irritate the back too much and end up triggering something that we don't want to trigger. Well, there's a couple strategies first. Be aware of your chin. A lot of people, you know, reading the phone, the chin comes forward. So just check yourself now and again. You know, bring the phone up a little bit. Oh, okay, now we have to use the shoulder muscles, but this is a lot better. Or if you're just standing in line for something, just be aware. And if the chin is pushing out, push it back a little bit. And I've, I've done these sorts of demos um, in classes where everybody has had, literally, everyone has had somebody else's back. And we feel what happens when the chin comes forward and you feel these muscles all of a sudden start to fire. And eventually, if they're weak, they start to fatigue and then eventually you'll trigger your pain. 
So just be aware of where the chin is. Now, what about your shoulders? If you stand like this, the shoulders have now come forward um, and you're probably leaning a little bit forward. So just bring your arms back to your side or put your arms, the easiest thing is to put them in behind. And the last thing I'm going to mention, a lot of people will stand and you notice how the butt is back a little bit. So if the butt is back a little bit, which can happen when you have a, a posterior pelvic tilt, which is beyond the, the scope of what we're doing today, then the back is having to fire an awful lot more to hold me vertical. So just be aware of that. Take your feet and the movement, I don't want you to do the movement, but just to convince your body you're doing it, move the feet out. So if I don't actually move my feet out, watch what happens. Do you see the hip comes forward? If I'm here and I push my feet into the floor and try and move them out without actually moving them, then I end up standing up. Now in a lineup, you'll notice that you might fatigue a little bit. So what I'm gonna suggest is just stagger your feet a little bit. So it can be as little as, as half of a foot length. And that gives you a little bit more leeway to stand with proper posture. If you're standing, like we would normally stand in a lineup with uh, feet in the, in the same line, hip width apart, then if I go beyond here, or if I go back to here, then I've lost my, my proper posture. With one foot slightly forward, you can put a little more weight on the forward foot. You can add a little more weight to the backwards foot and you have a little more room to move and still keep the same posture. So that's really about standing in, in a lineup um, if that sort of thing triggers your pain. What about in the kitchen? Uh, we all tend to you know, lean over the sink a little bit. How do we fix that? Easiest way, open the cabinet door, put your foot on the shelf. It sounds so simple, but wow, does it ever save the back. Watch what happens. So I'm, I'm washing dishes, but I open the door, I put my foot, oh, did you see what just happened? The hip came forward. So now I'm not taxing the back and using up my biological capacity and trigger the pain. You know why this works? You know who is probably one of the first to, to do this? In the pubs. In the pubs, they have that low rail. That's for your foot. That's so your back doesn't get tired and you'll have a few more drinks. Anyways, <laughs> let me move back. That's great. Thanks so much, Dave. A, a oh, few of the people were um, having a hard time seeing you. So please um, know that you'll get the recording. So if you want to review it, um, I think but maybe what was happening is the people on the phone, you have to swipe across to get to the to the other um, video. Um, so definitely uh, you'll see it in the recording tomorrow. I did ask a poll um, asking how many people suffered from low back pain, um, Dave, and it looks like 80 percent of the people on the call um, do okay. actively have low back pain. Okay, wow. All right. So we did the standing. So next steps, we want to build a foundation for pain-free movement and remain active for a good quality of life. So to build the foundation, we have to understand the pain triggers how to avoid the pain triggers, and that allows your back to desensitize. You learn spine-friendly movement patterns. We just did a few of those. There's a lot more that we can show you, walking, reaching, lifting, sitting, standing, getting up, uh, getting up from the floor. Um, we want to ensure that the glutes are active and, and support your movement. Sometimes after a back injury, the glutes become a little more inactive. And that means you're using other muscles of the, the body to make sure that you can do the movement patterns. And one of those muscles just happens to be, well, the hamstring and, and the low back, and that's not something you wanna do. 
We can show you how to build core stability and endurance, improve joint mobility and how you move, strengthen the weak postural mus muscles and learn how to exercise efficiently and properly. So we know remaining active is good for your muscles, tendons, ligaments, and joints, your mood and mental health, your sleep, and helping to prevent over 25 chronic conditions and helping to manage other chronic conditions. No wonder more and more doctors are starting to write prescriptions to get active. So Dave, if you take we just said else, I I was sorry, I just had a question um, from um, Shelly and Mark. Uh, any recommendations for medication to alleviate back pain flare-ups? Um, this per they have a heart condition and can't use um, NSAIDs. Uh, no, I, I think the best person to ask is your family doctor or a pharmacist. So the pharmacist where you get the, uh, the other medication um, you can let them know, remind them about that medication and, and ask them uh, for pain relief. Um, for if you are flexion intolerant, I can show you, uh, I've actually turned off the other camera now, but if you lie face down and just support the chin, you'll put the back into a slight extension and that can actually give you relief within uh, 30 seconds to a minute. And if you just stay in that position for another two minutes, uh, that, will, that will help immensely. But that, that works very well if you're flexion intolerant and I can show you other relief positions uh, for the other back pain issues. Uh, but as for, as for pain medications, that's really the, the realm of the medical community, so the, the pharmacists and the family doctors. Okay, so key takeaways from today. 85 to 90% of your back pain is from exceeding your biological capacity. These are the mechanical issues. And that means that there's a movement that you're doing the back doesn't like, there's a posture the back doesn't like, or you're loading your back incorrectly, or a combination of all three. Remaining active is good for your joints, mood, sleep, and overall health, and inactivity can make your pain worse. The big takeaway is you can rebuild your back's biological capacity once again and enjoy activities of daily life. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Dave, for that. That was amazing. So um, moving forward, uh, if you're interested in doing some low back work um, with Dave virtually or in person, depending on where you are, I'll put our contact information in and we can do some small group work specifically with the 80% of you that sounds like you have low back pain. If that's something you're interested in, um, you can give us a call. It's just Vintage Fitness um, website. Uh, and uh, I will send our contact information in the recording that you're going to get tomorrow. So thank you so much for attending. Dave, that was amazing. Thanks again. Um, and I'll just check. It looks like we have a question coming up. Um, oh, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation was the question. So I don't know um, why the chat was disabled. It was working on my end. So I'll have to look into that. But again, thank you. I hope you have a great afternoon and I really appreciate you coming.